Welcome back to Neff Inspiration, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today is a truly wonderful day because I've got Mukesh Kapila with me. Mukesh has written two books and I stumbled across his first book about his, his life in Sudan uh, and it completely blew me away and he allowed me subsequently to make contact with him. And uh, once we sort of started talking, I looked actually a bit deeper into him. And it is an amazing man. He's an amazing man. I mean, if I was trying to read you all his his accolades and all the positions he has, that he has held um, over the last decades, this would take us probably a quarter of the interview. But this man has been in all the crisis points um, that you can think about from Yugoslavia, from the Balkans, to the Sudan, to many other areas where the world is in real trouble. He has been involved with very big organizations. He has been, he has had the honor of, of working with governments to changing truly the lives of refugees, of people who were displaced, of people who were in constant hunger, who lived in crisis. Um, he was uh, the UN resident and humanitarian coordinator for the Sudan. Um, and that is one story that we want to talk about because he was one of the big whistle, well, the whistleblower who highlighted the plight of the Sudanese people uh, and so on. This man has done so much. And it's a true honor for me to have Mukesh on my show. Mukesh, welcome. I'm really, truly honored. Thank you. I'm very honored also to join you. <laughs> Greetings from uh, Geneva. <laughs> Indeed. From very cold and wet Geneva. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, we are heading towards your winter. We are finally getting into the summer here in New Zealand. Uh, so actually, yes, it's, it's not cold. It's actually just turning into spring. So I, I'm sending you a lot of energy and a lot of sunshine from New Zealand. And technically, I am from the future. Do, 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 because it is here a beautiful Saturday morning. So rest assured, the world is still going on a Saturday. So that might be a reassurance, especially for someone like you, who has been focusing on the darkness in the world and doing so for a very long time. Um, you initially grew up in, in India, um, but then had the, the insight to work hard. And you, you had been given the, the beautiful chance to come to the UK. I mean, that but that says already a lot how you got there. What, what, was the, what were the circumstances? You had to jump through a few hoops, didn't you? Well, yes. Uh, I... Uh... It, well, my life has been a little bit of an accidental journey and never more so in uh, that, that young age. I suppose I was about uh, uh, 16 then. And um, I, uh, growing up in India, in North India, in a place called Chandigarh, which is north of Delhi in the foothills of the Himalayas. And uh, went to school there, a very nice uh, uh, school. Um, and... Uh, uh, I was enrolled to go into a medical school in, in India, but then uh, one extremely hot uh, summer, I was uh, sheltering in the public uh, library, uh, and I used to go there really every day during the holidays, uh, because that was the only place with air conditioning. And uh, uh, so I would, uh, every morning, venture there after my Grandma would give me my breakfast and I would happily sit there reading random books and snoozing uh, when the mood, mood took me. <laughs> and then one day I found this uh, old magazine from the British Council saying that there was a scholarship available to come to uh, the UK for school leavers of my age to go on to higher schooling and uh, college. Uh, so I said, oh, but the problem was the magazine was about uh, several months out of date. Uh, and so I said, oh, well, what a pity. I wish I'd known about this uh, a few months ago. So, and uh, that was uh, the end of that. And I went home that evening, but couldn't sleep. Uh, uh, I couldn't sleep at all that night. So the following morning, I went back to my favorite seat in the library um, and uh, dug up the magazine again and took down the address and just wrote them a letter, uh, aerogram, 
Uh, in those days, you know, people send diagrams. Uh, this is way before emails and things like that. <laughs> and um, and I just wrote in my schoolboy hand um, that sorry, your magazine got to me too late, and I don't have time to uh, write off a form to fill in and such like. But anyway, this is me, and so I told my whole sixteen-year life story on the on the back of this aerogram and uh, put it in the letterbox and uh, I thought to myself, I won't tell anyone because this is uh, totally stupid. Uh, one, uh, it's applying so late. Secondly, uh, who, uh, you know, who's going to give uh, this chance to me? And so I probably forgot about it. Um, and um, I duly joined the college in India. But then about uh, 10 days later, uh, a telegram arrived uh, which uh, my uh, grandfather opened. Um, uh, uh, there's no privacy in Indian households, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> or at least at the time. So letters, posts, and so on were always open. And of course, who would send a telegram to a 16 year old uh, uh, boy? So he opened it and he read it, and it basically said, uh, um, uh, Scholarship now available, please cable reply. And the reason for urgency was that the, the English school term was starting. We are now talking about uh, September 1971. And, and uh, I had received this in the last uh, week of uh, August uh, 1971. So we were literally uh, two couple of weeks before term started. And hence, uh, the scholarship uh, was somewhat late. But it happened because somebody else had withdrawn from it. And they didn't want to waste the scholarship, so they offered it to the first random person uh, whose letter arrived in the mail. I have no doubt it was in the inbox, and uh, and uh, there you are. And uh, then uh, you know, basically, I uh, uh, my grandparents and parents puzzled over what this was, so I had to confess my <laughs> my initiative. Upon which, bless them, they I think uh, the whole business got into action, family, community, the local passport office, because I had to get a passport, and passports normally take a long time, uh, weeks, sometimes bribes, perhaps unnecessary. But even the passport office got terribly enthused by this, uh, by my strange story, and they immediately issued a passport, and, and um, uh, you know, people knitted me sweaters and old-fashioned uh, coats and God knows what else. Uh, because they got these things out of uh, English magazines as to what people wore. Uh, and uh, then I was trundled onto, onto a plane, the first time I ever traveled alone in my life, not even on a bus uh, before in my life. Uh, I led such a protected existence. And I duly arrived on the 3rd of September, 1971, in Heathrow. That date, my is uh, kind of burnt into my consciousness for reasons I think you can appreciate. <laughs> But here you are, you were a young man already taking action um, at a time when probably other other uh, juniors, other uh, young men of your age would have just, oh, no, they wouldn't even got the idea. Yet there was already a, a spark, uh, something going on in you to actually take that opportunity. And that is that is just your story, isn't it? You are you were always taking opportunities, and you were always uh, maybe at the right or wrong place, but just in the right time. To well, actually, I think one, to... one of the one of the reasons for that it's uh, it's uh, was that perhaps uh, I had no sense of fear or failure. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, well, as I thought about it, well, there's nothing, nothing to lose uh, other than the cost of a postage stamp and 15 minutes writing a letter in my in my best English and with my best uh, handwriting, um, and uh, and uh, what's there to lose? And Love it. and anyway, all they could say is no. That was one thing, and the second thing was really, actually, there was a fear of myself. I thought to myself, I would regret for the rest of my life if uh, I didn't try. And that fear, that fear of that thing, of actually not being able to forgive myself for not having tried <laughs> years later when people say, you know, how oh, could it have been different if I had tried? <laughs> so that, in a, in a sense, uh, in my little brain, uh, those calculations went on at 
a supersonic speed as I was cycling home um, <laughs> in the heat. And uh, in a sense, it drove me. And I, I guess that was my personality also, as you would say. But uh, I think today people are far too frightened. People are too afraid. They're afraid of their own shadows and uh, courage. And uh, maybe it's a, just a small example of what I was born with, thanks to my parents and grandparents who brought me up, but, uh, really not to be afraid. And that is where the, the beauty of your your second book comes in, Be, um, No Stranger to Mercy, because there you describe your life and you often weave back to your youth and give examples from, from your Indian uh, upbringing. And that gels so beautiful with then the events throughout your life. I think that was one of the strengths of your book um, to actually put it all together. It was actually really like uh, like my me reading this book was like a puzzle uh, becoming clearer with every single piece that was being laid there. So well worthwhile. Uh, it was it was a wonderful. It is a wonderful book. But here you were in the seventies, a little Indian boy in the British society, which even nowadays uh, is not very kind to strangers. Now, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you were taken in with open arms. <laughs> yeah, right. He says. <laughs> you well, had. I think the thing is, I considered myself extremely well informed about British society because I was also the school librarian back in uh, back in Chandigarh, my Indian hometown. Yeah. And uh, I used the privileges of being the school librarian to read everything. Uh, including stuff that I wasn't supposed to read until I was older. Anyway, I read all the uh, Enid Blyton books and all the, <laughs> all the uh, you know, Agatha Christie's and uh, all those things that are supposed to be the, the, the uh, typical of, uh, of uh, you know, of uh, uh, British life in those days. And uh, complete with all the words which we would uh, consider them uh, incorrect nowadays. And you know, all these books are being edited uh, uh, now. The role Dahl and so on are being edited nowadays. Anyway, I read them all, uh, um, and uh, uh, and so my uh, kind of preconceptions about uh, uh, English life was that one, uh, they would all uh, they all uh, lived in uh, uh, in castles and forts and beautiful homes. They all had servants at home. Uh, they all had cooks and gardeners. And, uh, you know, they uh, uh, were all uh, living uh, a very genteel and polite life. They had uh, scones. They had afternoon tea. And there was Harrods. And there was all those things that were, in my, that were in, my, in my head, really, all mixed up and jumbled up. And, uh, you know, amazingly, when I arrived, I made some friends in this uh, school called Wellington College, which is uh, one of the uh, 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 public schools, which, as you know, in the paradoxical English system, a public school is what you would call a private school, uh, an elite school. And the only reason I went to uh, Wellington, by the way, was that when these kind scholarship people uh, uh, wrote to me, uh, with the um, after the telegram, famous telegram, they said, "Which school would you like to go to?" So I uh, I responded uh, uh, that uh, oh any school is fine as long as it's not Eton or Harrow, uh, because in in the elite English literature books I had read, I all the famous people I knew it written in the literature I was reading, they all went to Eton or Harrow. Even the you know, Prime Minister Nehru went to Harrow. So I thought to myself, I'm not going to go to any ordinary school where everyone else seems to have gone. I don't want to go to these schools. I want to go to somewhere where all these presidents and prime ministers uh, and, uh, <laughs> and all these uh, people have not gone to. So, <laughs> so I wrote please, none of those schools. And uh, they chose uh, Wellington for me, uh, which uh, I had uh, never heard of, but uh, which uh, I think they made an inspired choice. And uh, I had a, um, a fascinating time uh, time there. Mm. And I got, and then uh, I think that the, because it was an elite school in the 1970s, naturally your friends were elite. So, uh, mm -hmm. but for me, just odd, normal people, because I thought everyone was like that in England. I had no idea that actually there were poor people. I had no idea that there were actually miners, shopkeepers, 
it was a pretty elite existence. Considering I, uh, I had a reasonably elite existence in India, it was easy to go to a relatively elite existence <laughs> in England. So I got invited to, um, uh, to uh, homes in the holidays, Easter holidays, summer holidays, because I had no family in, in India, sorry, in Britain. And so naturally my uh, good friends, uh, uh, which I acquired, uh, who I think uh, were more looking upon me as a form of a kind of curiosity, really, because uh, I was the one, I was only one of two uh, non-white uh, boys in the in the school, the other being the son of the Ethiopian ambassador. Uh, and uh, so I thought, maybe they thought this would be an interesting person to take home, perhaps. So when I arrived in my friend's homes, all my prejudices were fully confirmed. They had uh, they had uh, they had uh, chefs. They had uh, gardeners. Uh, when you went to bed, they turned your bed and left a piece of chocolate on the on the pillow. Uh, so I thought, oh, this oh, is a, this, this way of life. This <laughs> it's a normal. So so that's how was my first introduction to English uh, society. And uh, and then uh, you know once I got over little shocks like. Uh, for example, lying in bed, uh, sleeping, and then having people come through the door, lifting up my bedclothes to see if I was brown all over. And uh, I, 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 I don't think this was racism. I mean, you know, today the word racism is is uh, kind of has got very negative uh, tones, and it is a negative word. But in my innocence and also my general openness to the world, uh, I just thought, yeah, it's perfectly normal. I mean, if some strange person came along, I'd like to examine them carefully to see what manner of creature they were. And uh, to be examined all over was uh, uh, seemed to me a perfectly uh, natural thing to do. Uh, <laughs> so those were my sort of wow. experience in those uh, early days. And the other, uh, by the way, I must mention this, um, the, the, what is this about the English and the, and the baths? So uh, one, uh, uh, it's true that the English uh, public schools, uh, they seem to have a fixation with cold baths, which is, uh, which is uh, not something to be uh, admired, uh, uh, to be recommended in the middle of uh, winter in December, at least not to a little Indian boy. Um, and uh, uh, secondly, they, uh, I mean, I was brought up with a shower in India, and the idea that you got into, uh, into, into a bath of dirty water I don't know whether you emerged uh, uh, cleaner or not. So I took to I took to getting up earlier before anyone else, say at six o'clock in the morning, and having uh, my my bath because I thought the water would be cleaner at that time because even Russian hot water, you see. So uh, and this system worked fine from September when I arrived till about uh, late November when the, there was snow on the on the ground. And then uh, I said, hey, I can't get up at this time and go have a cold bath, uh, well, very lukewarm bath uh, at six o'clock in the morning. So then I ab absorbed all the other aspects, including the dirty bath water of the English culture at that time. <laughs> priceless, priceless, priceless. Huge culture, sh culture shocks, no doubt. Um, yet you were still in this kind of privileged society. That, however, um, did not last. I mean, ultimately, you, yes, whilst you might uh, still have the friends there, you soon became the victim of bullying uh, at school. Um, what did you deal with your first bully, with, the, with your first real bully? You described it so beautiful in your book. Well, I, 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 I understood uh, that uh, people became jealous of me because I was actually quite good at my... Uh, at my studies, remember, I had uh, read every book in the, in the library at my school in India, uh, okay. and I was pretty good at my studies. And uh, uh, but I wasn't uh, good at uh, sport, uh, especially this uh, the, uh, rugby. I know you are a New Zealander now, and rugby is a, is a kind of your national uh, uh, blood sport. But <laughs> but uh, for me at that age, it was just completely terrifying. Cricket, I could manage. But but rugby in a muddy field in December wasn't exactly my idea of fun. Anyway, uh, it was very clear that uh, English uh, field uh, sports like that uh, and I didn't uh, mix, uh, despite my admiration for English uh, culture, 
uh, and uh, I uh, I uh, became, uh, uh, but I had to do some sport. And so I joined the fencing club. Uh, so I became a, quite an expert fencer at my uh, at uh, at foil, epee, and saber, and really almost a, a champion. However, these kinds of minority sports, admittedly elite sports like uh, like fencing, they did not uh, appeal to the bullies amongst them, and uh, they wanted to, they wanted to, uh, you know, the more football, the soccer, and so on. So one. Um, uh, one of my uh, uh, tormentors, uh, let me call him, uh, that challenged me to a uh, uh, Little Kingsley. Now, uh, Little Kingsley is, is named after Kingsley M. He's a writer, and uh, he has association with uh, with Wellington. And they named the um, half marathon after him. This is running around the school, uh, through the forests and the woods and so on. But the school is a very is a huge one. It's actually set up. Uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, after named after the Duke of Wellington, and it's a, it was a military school. How, how I ended up in a military school, it just <laughs> worked with fate. I mean, as I told you. Anyway, so I was I was uh, challenged by Johnny to uh, run this half marathon, and uh, whereupon, what I experienced was the best and worst and worst of society. The best part of society was that as soon as this challenge went out and the whole school came to understand that uh, Johnny and I were going to uh, uh, do a competition run the following weekend, not following weekend, a couple of weeks from now, uh, you know, uh, uh, two camps started. Um, uh, remember, the, the British are very caste conscious as well and, the, and group conscious. So one group was obviously um, uh, on his side and another group, uh, said, right, we'd better uh, we'd better train this guy because we need good sport. Uh, remember that uh, there's no point in having a race between a completely feeble Mukesh and this marathon runner. Uh, I mean, that's uh, no good to anyone. So that sporting instinct, which is also part of the culture, came into its own. And so I got uh, unasked for trainers who would abuse me every day chasing me uh, almost with whips to try and get me up to, up to up to speed it was only later by the way that i discovered that uh, uh, again the gambling instinct is very strong in 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 britain at least at that time that this they had opened a book on this on me on this race so some people had bet <laughs> against and some people had bet for and uh, my, uh, my, uh, my uh, so uh, my other bully who was actually training me to, to run, he actually started a, 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 a book on me to say that I would win. And, and money was in bet that I would I would win. And of course, this guy was uh, known not to lose anything. He was quite a, 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 a bully himself. So I had no choice, but for two weeks, I had to go up and down, up and down the countryside. Uh, now, come the following day, the great weekend dawns and, and dawned, and uh, the whole school assembled uh, at the rugby field from where we took off and uh, where we were to go to the forests and so on, and then down uh, and back uh, to, uh, to the field. Um, and uh, soon I was left uh, far behind, of course. But these guys, my trainers were following me and giving and urging me on with all sorts of insults and abuses, which uh, I think uh, politely I will not repeat here. Uh, and uh, and uh, slowly but surely, slowly but surely, I I uh, overtook Johnny, and then beat him by a rugby uh, field's uh, uh, length, and that's how that particular race ended, and this, <laughs> and that completely transformed my fortunes in that particular particular uh, school. By the way, Johnny and I became very good friends afterwards. <laughs> Ah, amazing. Absolutely amazing. And it's just, well, again... I mean, that's not, well, not quite the final story, because uh, later on, Johnny and I were to compete for the same job in Cambridge when, uh, when I was a doctor, and he became a doctor too. And by chance, uh, uh, about 15 years later, we were to meet in the interview room of an uh, of a, of a, of a extremely elite hospital in Cambridge where I was doing my higher training, and so was he. 
So uh, we were to compete and uh, I had the satisfaction of uh, getting the job uh, there as well. So I was able to beat him there as well. But, but uh, <laughs> this, was, this was not about uh, uh, poor Johnny or anybody. It's really about the fact that you have to stand up to bullies, whoever they are. You must stand up to bullies because if you don't do that, you'll be running for the rest of your life. And I think therefore I found that that snippet of your of your story so interesting because later on you had to face very, very different bullies, far more dangerous bullies, far more disastrous bullies. And I want to take you straight there. Uh, we could go so many avenues, but I want to take you straight. Fast forward, you have become now a public health doctor. Um, and that in its own right was, is amazing. And we'll, we'll do a second interview just on, on some of these aspects. But um, I want to talk about the bullying. And I want to talk about the, your time in Sudan. Um, you had, uh, for those people that, that don't know much about world history, um, Sudan is a country in, in East Africa, but maybe, maybe you take us there. I mean, when you arrived, you were, what was your role in the Sudan at that time? And what were some of the events that initially transpired when you were there? Well, after a career in, uh, in the British government, in humanitarian work as uh, heading the, uh, 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 government, uh, the government department on humanitarian assistance, uh, I got seconded uh, to the United Nations and got appointed as the uh, humanitarian and resident coordinator, the UN chief, if you like, of uh, the senior most UN official in Sudan in, 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 uh, in 19... Uh, where well, was it? in 2000 in, in, in 2003, mm -hmm. uh, 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. they, it, uh, uh, at that time, Sudan was uh, Africa's uh, uh, biggest country. It hadn't split in two yet. And in Sudan was running the continent's uh, longest running war, almost since its independence from Britain and Egypt in the 1950s. And uh, my predecessors had all either been fired or uh, ran away in, with a mental state seriously impaired uh, by all the difficulties and complexities. And I was appointed in all innocence to see if I could make something of it. So my job was to, to uh, do two things. One, to help negotiate uh, some uh, peace between the uh, warring group in the north, which was mostly uh, Arab dominated uh, section of the country and the southern, more African group uh, and more Christian group in the south. This civil war, north-south civil war was going on a lot. And so the idea was to win the confidence of these people and through the act of helping uh, the suffering population uh, to bring about some rapprochement and using the good offices of uh, my function as the senior United Nations official uh, to win trust and uh, see if you can bridge these gaps and differences. So that was uh, generally the easy, easy remit of this uh, of this job. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, did you did you know that your predecessors um, had struggled and had had uh, a very harsh time? Did you know about the history prior to going to that secondment, going to that uh, position? I, in part, I think uh, 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 I remember going to New York, uh, 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 where the uh, high levels of the UN were trying to convince me to do the job, and uh, and uh, you know all the distinguished luminaries in the system met with me, and I was a little bit skeptical. Good. Um, good. I was about to say, <laughs> if something looks too good to be true, <laughs> yeah. and you know, one thing I said was, hey, I'm. I've never worked in the UN before, and two, I'm quite young still, uh, and uh, three, this is the UN's biggest program in the world, and I, if I get appointed, I will be the youngest UN chief in a, in a in a UN program in a country level, and uh, I understand my predecessor uh, only lasted six weeks. I'd really like to know more about what happened to him, and there was kind of mysterious uh, uh, 
garbled story, which I couldn't make head or tail of. <laughs> and then, uh, and the one before that, uh, uh, it was said, uh, uh, spent some years in, in a mental hospital uh, afterwards. Uh, though, uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, uh, he has recovered since then, I'm glad to say. But the point was that it wasn't good for your health, this position, either your mental or your physical, uh, physical health because of the political pressures. You know, can you imagine if you were the, if you were the UN coordinator in uh, uh, Palestine at the moment, mm. right? Uh, and in fact, uh, you should, uh, it's very uh, timely because only last week I was talking to a uh, former, uh, to a colleague of mine who was a UN coordinator in Palestine. Uh, we were talking about the current situation in Israel-Palestine, uh, in the Israel-Gaza -Gaza war. And the pressure you have when you head the UN is uh, extraordinary because even though you're supposed to be impartial and neutral, a civil servant who serves humanity, the world, you don't take your orders from any one uh, country. You're there to serve the United Nations Charter, uh, the principles and values on uh, which uh, are the founding uh, uh, ideas on which uh, after the Second World War, when the whole world was devastated, uh, uh, we got together and we created the United Nations, and you are the you are you are the symbol of that, and uh, you are in a sense uh, 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 you hold in your hand or, or in your person uh, uh, the hopes and aspirations of all of humanity. Not in you, I hasten to add, but in the position you occupy, you are the representative of all that is best of the dreams, hopes, and aspirations of humanity. That's the idea, right? And in practice. They, they try to, uh, you know, so in my first week, uh, we had a superpower, uh, a well-known superpower. Uh, I may not mention them here. So they come along and said, hey, we're very glad you're here. Um, you know, we have uh, got some very good uh, staff. Uh, if you would like to strengthen your office, uh, we can recommend you these experts who have a distinguished background in uh, uh, the state, oh, sorry, I almost mentioned the country. In the in a particular uh, in a particular uh, um, foreign ministry, and uh, and uh, we also have a lot of uh, money. USID is very um, uh, I should mention a very generous donor, and we would like you to appoint your chief of staff from uh, people we recommend. No. Ah. Um, so uh, there you are. And then uh, the, in the following afternoon, a regional part comes and says, you know, you need someone who can speak Arabic uh, because I don't speak Arabic. So I think as someone who understands the culture and the knowledge and so on, we've got just the right person for you. I think you should have them as your deputy. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, of course, someone else uh, comes and says, you know, you have to have a balance between the West and the East and the North and the South and the Moon and the Sun. And uh, then, uh, and, and that's only your side, so to speak, meaning, meaning the, the, the donors, the Western powers, the, the sort of country I come to. I mean, the, the Sudanese loved me initially because uh, the issue was, the, the, they thought I was ideal. Why? Because uh, uh, one, uh, I, uh, I came from Britain. I was a British citizen by then. Therefore, uh, they thought uh, I, had the, I had, if you like, the clout and influence of an important uh, member of the UN Security Council. Remember, we're talking here uh, 30 odd years ago and when uh, the, the UK was indeed a powerful and influential country. We're not talking about today's UK, which is just pathetic, but I'm talking about those days. So uh, I hope you're not going to edit that part out. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> uh, 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 so uh, so uh, they, they liked the idea that I was British. But they also liked the idea that I wasn't white. Mm. So I wasn't an, uh, an imperialist, a white imperialist pig, like the, like the British who had colonized Sudan, if you like, all those years ago. Um, I wasn't black, like the people in southern Sudan that were fighting the Arabs in the north, and I wasn't Arab. In fact, I was Asian, I was Indian. Mm. Now, Indians are well regarded because they're a kind of up and coming power, even in those days. But generally speaking, they're a fairly harmless uh, nation in, when it comes to third world solidarity and yeah. saying the right stuff. And everybody knows Gandhi and Nehru and all that. So they thought, ah, an Indian who is British, so has the backing of, of a powerful country and therefore the money to go with it to come and to be the UN chief uh, and uh, who is not in, who's not black or Arab. 
So it was an ideal uh, photo <laughs> profile for the, for the for the for the job. Uh, huh. And uh, they and they also thought that they could because I came from a developing country, uh, India originally. They maybe people from the developing countries are more malleable, more bullyable, if you wish, to uh, having your muscle twisted by the <laughs> reigning government of the dictator, uh, military dictator Omar Bashir, uh, <laughs> who was ruling at that uh, time. And when I met the president, he was certainly extraordinarily affable uh, uh, with me. So, uh, uh, but then as events started within the first few weeks, cold reality struck me, apart from the problems within my own team. Uh, and I realized that there were not many I could uh, trust and how many of them were uh, implanted agents of governments and, and uh, how many were genuine uh, UN staff. I uh, I wasn't naive enough to, I was not that naive to not uh, uh, try to think about this one. And then uh, um, the news started that there was fighting going on in a place called Darfur, which was extremely far away. And uh, uh, I didn't even know where it was. So I went to the map in my, in my office to actually locate it. And then I, I realized it was really far away. It was about uh, a good, uh, um, a good four or five hours, a uh, good four hours flying in my plane. Um, I had my own plane as the UN chief. And uh, uh, then uh, I uh, found out a bit more and more reports started coming in. And so I decided to go and have a look. And when I flew over it, I began to recognize a pattern. And this reminded me of a, a previous experience that I had in 94. Uh, in uh, as a British government official, when I was the first British government official to go to Rwanda. And uh, this was in the, right in the middle of the genocide uh, during the 100 days of killings. And I was there, uh, um, uh, I suppose, because I couldn't find anyone else to be rash enough to go there. But I arrived there within, within the, uh, the blood was still running down uh, the walls of the church where people had taken uh, a refuge. And the bodies were stuffed down the, the, the pipes in in the system. And uh, I, I, began, I uh, th that impressed me so much. So when people ask me where my career in human rights business started, I always go back to the Rwanda experience where I witnessed uh, so much. Anyway, 10 years later, as the head of the UN in the Sudan, I began to recognize that the killings in, in Darfur resembled a pattern, a pattern that I had seen in Rwanda. In other words, one group of people, in this case, uh, uh, Arab uh, tribes were massacring another group of people uh, who were uh, 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 black African groups. Now, uh, to me, looking, they look the same. They're all intermingled and so on. So, but I knew that identity is socially constructed. It's not something, it's not what you look like. It is who, right. you, th who you say you are. And when I flew over Darfur, which by the way, is uh, the size of France. So it's a vast country, a uh, vast region. And, uh, I could see that uh, not everything was ablaze. And uh, there were some villages that were being targeted and then a few seconds flying time, there weren't. So when I came back and I plotted the GPS coordinates of the uh, burning villages uh, and the secure villages, you could see that this was ethnic targeting, ethnic cleansing. So then I had to speak up about it and that's when all my troubles started. And we have to say that that from the word go, you didn't have an easy uh, easy time in Khartoum. So Khartoum is the the, the capital um, of the uh, of the Sudan, or uh, what? It, yeah, was then. And um, the issue was that your predecessors were actually fired. So the UN has to be invited for by the the ruling um, government. And there was initially, there was a bit of a doubt that you even get accepted by them. But because of all these perceived advantages, they actually accepted you. But then you you got the first few uh, inclinations that actually that there's something nasty happening. And well, so Clinton, Clinton had said uh, in relation to Rwanda, uh, uh, you know, he apologized and he said that it shouldn't happen again. You know, not on our watch. Mm. Uh, uh, never again, right? And uh, and in in Rwanda, I was a junior government official. 
But in the case of Sudan, I was the UN, the head of the UN. It was my watch. It was my patch. So I think that responsibility was what was weighing me down. And, and uh, you know, I said earlier that uh, it's not me that is important, but the position I occupy representing the best of humanity is a, is a sacred trust. And if you are a high UN official occupying a, a high pedestal like that, it, you, it's not so that you can be arrogant. It is that you are the holder <laughs> of that trust, the yes. position of uh, faith that the rest of the world has in that uh, position. And yeah. that was, I think, seminal to my analysis of what and, I should do. And I think that's important because you you had a conviction that you needed to speak out. Yet um, the, the government was actually ultimately responsible um, the, the Arabic tribes that you were mentioned, the Janjaweed, were essentially a bunch of very nasty people, um, Islamic terrorists, if you wanted to call it like that, um, some very, very nasty people that were very much in bed with the government in Khartoum. Um, so the government was working against you. You had in within you had frictions and and trouble within your own team. Plus, then when you actually were sending back messages to the UN, the UN was not really sort of saying yes, finally, finally, Mukesh, you're speaking out. That was not really the response from your from the bosses from from the UN, was it? Uh, no, that was my that was a uh, that's when my idealism uh, met reality. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, landed very hard on the ground. Uh, basically, I sent report after report. I think it's important for your listeners uh, to also understand that in the early 2000s, we were dealing with what I judged to be, and history has proved this uh, subsequently with the International Criminal Court, the first genocide of the 21st century. Remember that I had already witnessed the last genocide of the 20th century in Rwanda. And, uh, and uh, the Rwanda genocide was at a time when we didn't have emails. I remember talking to General Delaire, the Canadian commander in charge of the peacekeeping forces. And you know, I met uh, subsequently and compared uh, notes. And uh, you know, he sent his messages by fax machine uh, in the 1990s. Uh, I don't know if any of any of your listeners have even heard of a fax machine. But, uh, to the, <laughs> but in my time, uh, you know I'm old, but I'm not that old. It's only 20 odd years ago. Uh, we had email. Not only that, I had the first early generation of BlackBerry in my pocket. Uh, and uh, as, I, as I flew over, uh, over Darfur, I was taking photos of what was going on with the GPS coordinates and using my pilot's uh, uh, communication systems and beaming them straight in real time to mm. the headquarters of the UN, to the office of the Secretary General, mm. to his antechamber, to his, uh, to his uh, assistant, if you like. See? So never before in the history of humanity have we known so much of mass evil unfolding in real time. In the case of the Holocaust, uh, uh, in the Second World War, we, we, we knew, we suspected what was going on after a time, but it was only when the camps were liberated that we learned the worst details. And the same was true in Rwanda and the other places that uh, are familiar in history. But here I was uh, really at a moment in time with all the technologies at our disposal, uh, my own plane, my own communication systems. Uh, and uh, uh, I was, it was literally, as I said to, to some media at the time, it, it was as if I was in the middle of a horror movie, uh, uh, be, I was, as if I was an actor in a horror movie, mm. myself having a role in, in, that, in that movie, even as I was filming the movie of which I was a part. It was a horror movie, or as I've also said, a snuff movie. I mean, to be vulgar about, to be <laughs> vulgar about it, because the people were being snuffed out, the people were being snuffed out, if you, if you like, see. So this is, uh, so, so uh, I think uh, uh, for me, there were a number of things that lay in my head. The, I was the youngest UN coordinator. I had a huge career ahead of me. If I did a reasonable job there, there was no reason why I could not go from 
from uh, high position to high position and lead a, and lead a elite gilded <laughs> career, uh, you know, and uh, who knows uh, what. Uh, and uh, and to speak up, what well, uh, I was to sacrifice everything. At the same time, I also had a young family. My children were at school back in the UK. And uh, I, I was no doubt what the consequences would be if I spoke up. Uh, so especially when I knew that my bosses in the UN uh, uh, didn't want to know me, not only that, uh, as soon as my messages started arriving, they were almost like uh, disowning me as if I had leprosy or something. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, I would get no response. It, my messages fell into a big black hole in, uh, in New York. Uh, there was no response at all. Uh, and uh, that was a dilemma I faced uh, when uh, I had to decide uh, whether I go public with this or continue my private diplomacy. Because all this wasn't, I wasn't just sitting there witnessing and writing reports. I was involved in a heavy game of diplomacy. Uh, you know, I'm just reminded of Anthony Blinken, uh, US Secretary of State, going around all the, the capitals in the Middle East at the present time. And the guy was looking pretty sleepless on his last uh, last uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in Jerusalem. I mean, uh, uh, you know, but uh, at least uh, whatever it is, you can say that he is trying, he tried. And I was trying constantly. Every day I was beating my, uh, my path to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to different members of the government, to the president's office, uh, writing lots of demarches, which is diplomatic language for protests, if you like. There are all those are on my website, by the way, for anyone to see. And, uh, and I was uh, uh, kind of completely uh, ignored and even threatened. They, uh, so, so I remember the, in, the, in the foreign ministry of Sudan, uh, a very senior official saying to me, you know, Dr. Kapila, he said to me, uh, your predecessor only lasted six weeks. Uh, do you really want to go down that route? Wow. And these direct threats were there. You describe a meeting uh, in which you spoke out. You had a lot of the, the Sudanese officials there and who were listening to you when a young woman um, started speaking up in the, in the background. Yeah, in one of my visits to the Darfur region uh, and uh, traveling around, which of course was under strict supervision of the uh, um, the Sudanese intelligence uh, services who escorted you uh, everywhere, ostensibly for my security. Um, uh, <laughs> there was yeah. a public meeting. Uh, there was a public meeting, and uh, to, to find out what was happening and what help we, we the UN could give, uh, food, water, because the fighting was going on. That wasn't uh, hidden. You can't hide fighting. And my concern was also uh, humanitarian relief. So people were saying uh, what their issues were and uh, healthcare they needed, hospitals and so on. And then, um, uh, but all the people who were speaking were old men sitting in the front row. And uh, as if they were the official spokesmen appointed by the authorities to be the interlocutors. And then this uh, very young woman uh, hesitantly got up at the back and uh, uh, stood up and uh, raised her hand and uh, started speaking at which all the uh, front men uh, hushed her. And I said, no, 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 uh, please let her speak. Uh, and then uh, she spoke and uh, she basically uh, said what I suspected, but said it uh, with a much more conviction than any observer can because she'd been through it, you see. So she described uh, the, uh, uh, the violence against communities, the burning of houses, the, the poisoning of wells, the uh, the uh, rapes that were going on uh, as uh, women went out to collect firewood for the family uh, cooking meal, uh, and uh, the terror in which uh, people were living, and uh, why so many thousands had already uh, fled to neighboring Chad, and were even more so they were doing. And uh, people started to hush her, but uh, uh, I said, no, no, let her speak. And, and then, uh, um, I think that uh, uh, was my first direct eyewitness account. I mean, I had my own eyes to witness, but this was a, a local person uh, saying it with huge courage. And uh, uh, so 
so that uh, gave me a lot of food for thought. I said, I really have to, got to do something about this, uh, with, about with this information. And uh, so I uh, uh, started positioning more staff in Darfur. Mm. But then there were threats starting against the UN. And, uh, you know, I, I was told I, I had to withdraw the UN staff from Darfur because uh, the government could not, um, sorry, because uh, there were threats against the security because of the fighting that, that, that was going on. It's like, imagine being in, in Gaza. Remember how many people, have all, how many UN workers have already died in Gaza because of the bombings and fightings. In our case, there was also bombings and fightings going on bombing by the Sudanese army and fighting between all the different groups, including Sudanese army and the paramilitaries. So, uh, and, uh, so that was a dilemma I was in. So I got back to my office uh, and I was mulling over all this uh, uh, when uh, uh, another young woman arrived at my office and uh, she'd, uh, I don't know how she spent a thousand kilometers um, across the burning sands from Darfur to come to my office. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, she was making big uh, noise outside my office. And uh, finally, my assistant uh, came, that mad woman wants to come and see me. So I said, oh, send her in. Uh, yeah. I'm surrounded by many people, one more won't make a difference. So uh, and she came in and she tell, told me a story that uh, fundamentally changed not just what I had to do right there and then, but what I had to do for the rest of my life. So if there was a pivotal moment in my, in my, in my life, it would be that uh, it was what Aisha uh, said as she sat in my uh, office and she narrated how, for example, she had been raped and herself she had been raped, gang raped. Her English was quite uh, okay, but we had Arabic translated with my assistant. And, uh, and she described uh, how, uh, how it happened to her in Tawila, which is a small town in, in, in Darfur, and, and how she had been raped in the marketplace by... Uh, lots of people in front of her husband, in front of her children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, and then I could not but admire her courage that despite all of that, she got up and somehow managed to find her way from Darfur uh, through, uh, I don't know, walking and trucks and God knows what else, uh, to come to the total stranger in a strange office um, uh, to tell her intimate story to a total uh, stranger. And I'll tell you, at that time, uh, it was very difficult to get to see me because I was under heavy guard. The reason I was under heavy guard was because my counterpart, Sergio Vera de Mello, uh, who was uh, my uh, UN coordinator and head of the UN in Iraq at that time, had just been assassinated by an Al-Qaeda bomb in Baghdad. And when that happened, and of course, uh, you know, the, the Sudan was known to house these, many of these uh, people, uh, uh, then basically I was basically in a prison surrounded by my own security and then my uh, the government security. And then uh, it was impossible to get in to see me. But this persistent young lady uh, uh, did and asked her why. And she said, she simply said one phrase which is burnt in my head to this day. She said, oh, because you are the UN. And then she said, after a little pause, she said, and uh, you look like a good man. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you will do something. Uh, I don't know what you will do, but you will do something. Aww. And, uh, I, and uh, I mean, I'd never seen her before in my life, okay? And uh, I, 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 I don't know whether I was good or bad, but now I was going to be good because she <laughs> said I was good. Yeah. And she said I was UN. And the UN is good, and I'm good, and we are good. And good people do not betray their sacred cause. Wow. So that was the moment that I wow. realized where my sense of duty lies. My sense of duty was not in worrying about my pension or my, 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 my fees or my school children, which, the, which uh, of my children, uh, that the UN was uh, uh, generously uh, uh, paying on my massive salary. And believe me, I've never earned so much in my life as I did uh, when working in the UN. Um, and uh, I instantly realized some kind of buttons uh, 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 was pressed. And, uh, and then I castigated myself. I said, how could I have even thought of not speaking up? I mean, why did I even go through the mental torture of at least... Uh, 
a few days, wondering what, where my duty lay, when my duty was as obvious as the words of this young woman who had uh, uh, amazingly found her way across for that. There was a, uh, sorry, I uh, find it uh, difficult sometimes to, uh, to relive that, uh, that part of it because it, it was like, a, like, a, like a, an electric shock as well as a cold douche. Uh, uh, you know, if I can call it this all at the same time, but that's the effect of this uh, of Aisha was on uh, on me, and uh, so then there and then I decided I would not only tell what was going on, but I would say it in such a way that uh, there would be no silencing, and the <laughs> genie would never go back in, in, in no back in the box. Oh. That was that was my determined. Uh, uh, impact of that young woman's uh, uh, personal testimony. Wow. Wow. And that's how you became a whistleblower in the in the truest meaning of the word. Um, well, to be honest, I never, I never even uh, thought of the word whistleblower at that time. What I thought was uh, to how I could outwit them. I had, remember, I had to outwit two people. I had to outwit the Sudanese government. Mm. The genocide, in my opinion, uh, 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 on whom I depended. I was in the country. I was in their uh, under the, their um, jurisdiction, so to speak. And I had to outwit my own bosses, the Secretary General of the United Nations at that time, uh, Kofi Annan, uh, my bosses in the uh, Department of Political Affairs, the Humanitarian Department, and many others. I had to outwit them both because they were both stopping me. Mm. Uh, from speaking up, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, we were on completely opposite sides. So then I, that's when I decided that if I was going to do it, I was going to do it in style. So that's when I used the time difference between uh, between <laughs> between Nairobi. I had an office in Nairobi, and uh, there was no media in Khartoum, so the only way to speak was to go to Nairobi, the regional uh, media hub of uh, that part of Africa. And the time difference between Nairobi and uh, New York was. Uh, Six, seven, eight, nine, nine hours, eight, nine hours, given uh, time, and um, then I thought I would do it uh, kind of uh, mid morning when uh, New York would be fast asleep, uh, and uh, the the UN spokesperson, the minder, and my own bosses would be uh, happily tucked in bed, uh, and uh, and I would uh, hit the waves, and so it happened. It was it was breaking news on that day on the BBC on the Voice of America and uh, on uh, all sorts of strange journals and things. I gave out my phone number to everyone. I said, any media anywhere in the world, uh, give them my number. They can get me and I'll give them interview. I will give them interviews. So, and and it was got, you know, even small magazine, small the Peshawar Bugle in Northwest Pakistan, who's ever heard of them? Um, and uh, God knows, Obscure, obscure um, local newspapers. I said no. It, they're all equally important. So of course I go spoke to BBC, Voice of America, CNN, all those people. It goes without saying I would speak to them. And then it became so much. So then uh, I said, okay, I better do a press conference <laughs> now. Now after I've given exclusives to everyone, think that exclusives that you say exclusive to everybody, and uh, then everybody's happy. The, uh, the media that is, you see, oh. they love exclusives. Uh, so I gave many exclusives. <laughs> and then I said, we better do a joint conference. You know, 200 people turned up. These are, this is all the world's TV, radio, newspapers, that bureau chiefs located in Nairobi. There was no space in my little office and I had to go into the garden. And they had to, uh, they had to put up, uh, I don't know, lighting to, uh, for the cameras. And uh, uh, New York, by the time New York woke up, they did not know what had happened. And by the time uh, 10 o'clock came around in uh, New York, no, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, this is when the UN spokesman gives his daily uh, conference uh, to the world's press. Every day it happens, it happened since time immemorial. <laughs> there was only one question uh, by the world's media, by Reuters, AFP, everybody was asking, and New York Times, and everyone was there saying, well, what do you think of the remarks of your representative in, in, in Khartoum? So I calculated, that uh, they had, uh, they could either uh, say that I had gone mad, 
Uh, after all, my predecessors uh, had problems also, uh, and I had gone I had gone mad, or they could deny what I was uh, saying and refute me. But whatever happened, if they did that, it would become the news, you know. So in a sense, they had no option but to say that they would, in fact, what they said was, we are deeply concerned by, by the developments uh, going on in Darfur, as our representative, the UN coordinator has uh, outlined, and uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, we are doing our best. We really want member states to do more, Security Council, this, that, and the other. So they did not, they did not have the courage to refute me. Mm. They did not, because I knew uh, also, thanks to my Blackberry photos and uh, all the rest of it, that I had one thing that uh, people did not have in previous genocides as they were unfolding. They had evidence. Mm. And I had a file this thick, including mm. right down to time, date, and uh, which army unit was involved, in which killing, in which village, at which moment. Uh, and uh, against that, uh, I think they couldn't do anything other than to uh, say, uh, uh, to agree with me, but they didn't do that. Uh, they didn't agree with me, but they didn't deny me. Right. So I knew that I had, uh, I had passed a uh, Rubicon there, uh, but then of course, uh, I also knew that I was done. Uh, I knew that my time was up and I knew that was up because I started getting death threats uh, from and, uh, the Arab uh, newspapers. My staff would not show me the headlines because, uh, well, they had to translate the headlines and they, they wouldn't do it for me. And the, our media reporting wouldn't uh, share the media reporting. This did not have frightened me. But these were, these were literally jihad and uh, someone should take him out and I've insulted uh, their culture, I've insulted mm -hmm. this, that, and, and the other. All those death threats, really vicious uh, death threats, which I knew were, were, uh, were, were, uh, were um, uh, the, uh, the UN security back in New York was very worried about that because whatever their dislike of me at this stage, the last thing they wanted to do was me turn into a martyr, uh, you know, uh, and, and that wouldn't have played down very nicely in terms of the reputation of the UN either. Mm -hmm. enough, the government uh, threatened me, but it wasn't in the government's interest either to, to get me killed because this wouldn't put the government in a good light either. So there I was literally a hostage. Uh, if you if 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 you like, it's like these poor hostages in uh, sitting in Gaza. It's not in the interest of the of the of Hamas to kill them, though they may well do. They're nasty people, these Hamas. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I think you can't uh, negotiate for their release uh, uh, either. You know, you know what all the thing is going on. Mm -hmm. So it's a very peculiar situation uh, uh, to be in. But I knew my time was up because uh, of something much more important. Uh, I knew that the government of Sudan. Uh, would uh, uh, declare me persona non grata, meaning they would uh, uh, they would uh, uh, oblige me to leave the country, uh, just say uh, uh, to give me an expulsion order uh, and uh, de-recognize my diplomatic status. And uh, if I didn't uh, do that, which the French government uh, tried to do when the French government uh, refused the Niger militia who ordered the French ambassador to leave Niger a few months ago, um, but in the end. If the Sudan government would not cooperate with the UN mission, I remaining there was blocking any action because mm. my being there as a hostage meant that the outside world could act because I was the UN coordinator, I was there. And I, but I was, I was completely disempowered by the UN on one hand. And mm. on the other hand, the Sudan government would not cooperate with my uh, health uh, health program, my education program, my relief program, my food program, and the million things we were doing every day beyond the headlines, saving lives and bringing relief mm -hmm. uh, to all, all over the world. And I, the last thing I wanted to do was uh, be an uh, obstruction in the way of uh, that. So I decided uh, to, to leave 24 hours before they would declare me persona non, non grata. And uh, so not to give them the satisfaction to say that uh, they had uh, asked me to leave. So I was uh -huh. never declared persona non grata. Symbolically, that's extremely uh, important. Many people think I was declared persona non grata. No, I never gave them that satisfaction. I left because, uh, and I, well, I came voluntarily and I left voluntarily when my job was done, which was to tell the world about the first genocide of the 21st uh, century. 
And then, of course, the death threats followed me, uh, and uh, this was a this was a problem in um, uh, you know that was to follow me to my subsequent place in in uh, in uh, Geneva and uh, for many years afterwards. Wow. I don't wow. know if I've given you too, too much detail as well. But it's I, beautiful. I nine, 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 nine. You were spot on there um, because that is that is your life. This was one of those pivotal moments where you were given a personal choice. Do I do the right thing and live with the consequences? Or do I do do I just shut up, protect my own career, um, protect maybe my own life, protect the life of my family, which inevitably might become uh, collateral damage in any jihad or in any kind of whatever it is uh, fatwa that is that is that is announced against you so here you are basically it is you you made a call and you spoke out at a time when many others stayed silent and i think that is so beautiful but it is one of the hardest things you can do to become a whistleblower and to know that you're risking absolutely everything if you were I mean, I know already the answer. I was about to ask you actually, if if you had to do it again nowadays, I know the answer. You would. You you spoke with so much conviction. I would, uh, I, I, I would certainly do it again, but I do have something regrets. And I said earlier that I wish I'd done it earlier because many people will ask me afterwards. Well, if you've been going around seeing all this, uh, why did you not speak earlier? Maybe if you had spoken earlier more lives could have been lost. Maybe the world could have acted uh, earlier. And it is an extremely fair, fair question. The problem was you cannot accuse your government, a sovereign government to whom you are credited mm. uh, uh, for, uh, mm. for the biggest of all crimes, which is uh, uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, right? Yeah. You can't do that without uh, evidence because like this hospital bombing in 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 uh, Palestine that has happened in the last uh, two three uh, days, you know, if you don't have the evidence, then exactly. the denials and the refutation uh, completely undermines your case. The reason the UN were left speechless was because I had I dotted all my eyes and crossed all the T's and collected mm. so much data and information that there was no way. And I had to do the same with the, the uh, diplomatic community and the and the and the authorities. Uh, and uh, it it was only when all that data was uh, on a flash drive and given to a diplomat of a friendly country to smuggle out in the diplomatic pouch, <laughs> uh, because you know I, what I was afraid of was it's all my, on my laptop and and uh, you know and computer systems. That uh, regardless of my uh, my personal protection as a diplomat, <laughs> uh, nobody respects that. If there is an existentialist issue here, they would come and they would make some accident, uh, take my uh, machine and wipe it or interfere mm -hmm. with with uh, that. Of so, course. I, but I knew my job was done once I smuggled all the information out uh, via diplomatic career, thanks to a friendly uh, embassy. Uh, not just once or twice, I had insurance policies because I didn't know whether this diplomat would actually do it. So, and so I thought I'd go to two or three different countries. Excellent. So it was out there. So that was that, so. The thing is, when you are in, involved in these things, uh, you develop some uh, skills that you know, I keep on saying that I felt I was in a movie. Uh, I, you know, because these are the sort of things you would perhaps. Uh, uh, see described on Netflix uh, in some kind of thriller, and uh, believe me, it was anything but thrilling living in this in this thriller that I was I inadvert inadvertently strayed into, but then stayed uh, not only as a side character but somehow become a central character of, uh, if you like. It wasn't out of choice, but it was out of necessity. So all those factors were were, were playing. So you become sharper. So my advice to anyone planning to do this is, if you want to be a, a speak up for what you believe in, don't, don't just uh, do it, uh, blurt it out uh, one morning in a bad mood or in, in deep emotion or something. Plan it. 
this is something done with cold courage, not hot emotion. Because when you do it, you only have you only have one chance at it. So if you're going to speak up for some uh, obscenity or injustice in your community, in your country, in your office, in your organization, it doesn't matter whether it's to do, it doesn't matter what it's to do with. Do it as I did in cold, calculated fury. That's what I was doing it in. It was, it was planned towards the steps I was undertaking. And uh, so that I would leave behind me a situation that would never be the same again uh, in, in terms of the world uh, and, uh, and not knowing what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but there's another point I want to make, which is important for your listeners, perhaps, you see. Uh, I mean, you and others have been very kind to me by saying uh, many, many uh, uh, kind words about the position I took. And uh, all sorts of nice things have been said. Even awards have been given uh, for that. But uh, to be honest, I feel an imposter. I, I, <laughs> well, think about it. I mean, my life, this is, if I was to ask, you know, if I was asked to design my epitaph on my, on my tombstone, uh, well, I want to be cremated. So on wherever my, <laughs> wherever a little plaque is going to be put, um, a very tiny plaque. Um, what would the word say? If I had my choice, I would say uh, his life was a failure. Because, and this is the honest truth about what I feel about myself. Here I was, through all the backstory that we've hinted at, found myself in that position at a moment in history witnessing the greatest of all crimes and in a position to do something about it. The optimistic view would be, I tried and made a difference. The real view is that uh, actually the genocide actually happened. So when the record is written, if you, if you judge things by, the cold lens of facts and figures. The point is, whatever nice words you may say about me, 300,000 people at least died. And several million are displaced. Many of them are still displaced. Countless rapes took place. By some estimates, one in three women were raped. Disease epidemics uh, took place. And 20 years later, the cycle of violence repeats itself with the same perpetrators and the same uh, victims. Now, when uh, you have that as a track record, I don't know uh, if you were that person, what would you want written honestly on your epitaph? That's why, uh, you know, um, uh, I, as I remember saying on some, on Hard Talk on BBC, uh, when they were interviewing me, uh, they said, then what do you think of your, place uh, in history. And my reaction was, what would you like to be known as? The person who couldn't prevent the first genocide of the 21st century, having witnessed the last genocide of the 20th century. Nobody <laughs> wants to be in that position. So I, I, I know you will probably say as a psychologist, you will say mm. that I'm being too harsh on myself and I'm flagellating unnecessarily, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you will, you will, uh, you will, you will say that. But in, in truth, that is uh, what I uh, also feel. No, Mukesh. And you're right. You're right. I, I very much feel your emotion here. But having said that, there is, there is only so much that one man can do. You were not able to be there you are not omnipresent you can't go to every village and stop the burning stop the raping stop everything that is no but you you were doing what you could do and you were doing more than 99.9 percent .9 of the people around you you did more than them and that is that is an amazing thing that you did so therefore i uh, 
I disagree with your imposter syndrome. However, I know exactly how you feel because that imposter syndrome is in me just as much as in, in, in many other people who try to make this world a better place. But that is the only thing that we can do. We can only uh, try to live a life with intention and try to live a life that gives us the best opportunity to influence the little bubble around us. And, and, and some of us, like you, you have got bigger bubbles that you can influence. And that's what you're doing. That is what you the amazing work that you have been doing because you then moved on towards other other uh, roles in which you made a huge difference. So let's not be be too harsh on ourselves. We can only do what we can do in, in, in certain times, but it's important that we do take action. And you did when others stayed silent. And I think for that, I want to thank you for that. I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful that you came onto my show to actually share this passion and share the, the facts there and maybe give others the hope that it is okay to speak out and to to try to make a difference. But I love the way you you said it. Do it in, in a cold fury, not in hot emotional turmoil. Wow. Oh, Mukesh, what an interview. I'm very, very, very grateful uh, for the time you were able to spend with me. Um, your two books are beautiful out there. Tell us once more the name um, of the books. Well, the first one which describes my torturous, tortured life in Sudan is called no, um, uh, Against a Tide of Evil. Mm. So if people are going to read, read that one first. And then the other one, uh, is called No Stranger to Kindness, because my in my subsequent life I've, uh, uh, and in my previous life, I've uh, come across so many stories of uh, heroism, extraordinary right. sacrifice and kindness, as the book says, No Stranger to Kindness, that uh, the two books are really complementary to each other, good and evil, which are in us and around us and will always be with us for as long as we are human. Guys, go out there, get yourselves uh, the, the books. I put the links uh, to your books down there into the description of the YouTube video and of the podcast. I thoroughly enjoyed every single word that I read there. Mukesh, you're an amazing man. I so hope that I can get you back here onto my show because there are so many other aspects of your life which would benefit everyone out there to hear about. But for now, I want to thank you again. Send you all my, my love, my energy from New Zealand to Switzerland, uh, to Geneva. Uh, and thank you so much again for being here. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you. Thank you and my <laughs> best to all your, to all your uh, listeners. You out there, look after yourself. Bye. Bye. <laughs>